combining carbs and fat, LDLC, calcification, and atherosclerosis. Hi, I'm Chris Masterjohn, and I have a PhD in nutritional sciences. I am not a medical doctor, and nothing contained in this episode may be construed as medical or nutritional advice of any kind or a substitute, therefore. This episode is meant purely as scientific education. If you wish to act on any ideas presented in this episode, please consult your physician first and never take anything herein as a reason to contradict medical advice. With that said, enjoy the episode. Let me have a second question. So the question is around just macronutrient combinations in meals and fat metabolism. Okay. In the early 2000s, John Berardi, I don't know if you're familiar with him, he posted he an article on T Nation that outline rationale for eating, maximizing muscle, minimizing body fat, where you, it was called massive eating. So if you've, if you've read it or know about it, just stop me and I'll go to the question. But the I context- I know who John Berardi is, but I haven't read that article. Okay. So the rationale that he outlined in that article was to avoid substantial amounts of fat combined with carbs in meals. And so the idea was eat protein, plus fat or protein plus carbs, but minimize the combination of carbs and fat. Not to exclusion, but like say five grams of fat in a protein carb meal and 10 grams of carbs in a fat protein meal. And the idea was really around mm, body composition and minimizing fat storage. And so, you know, anecdotally, I, I did that for probably eight years and it worked really well. And I massed a good amount of muscle and leaned myself quite a lot. And so anecdotally, it seemed to work. But I've also kind of since changed to more of a 40, 30, 30 or 50, um, you know, 30, 20 kind of ratio and maintain the same body composition. But the, the question I had around that was, Besides the body composition aspect, do you have any thoughts around whether that could help with regard to cholesterol levels and um, LDL levels and calcification, atherosclerosis? Yeah. Um, well, I think this is. Um, I think a lot of it is contextual around uh, your metabolic response to these things as well as your body composition. So generally speaking, like if someone is overweight and hyperglycemic, then it's they're probably going to get a lot of benefit from trying to separate their carbs and fat. Whereas if someone has amazing body composition and is totally, you know, healthy blood glucose level that while they're eating a mixed diet, then I think it's kind of pointless. Um I would say that for blood lipids, generally, if macronutrients are going to affect your blood lipids, um, it's that's probably involving. Well, I mean, macronutrients. If you're fasting blood lipids, uh, which is what's usually measured, um, if if changing your macronutrients around is going to affect those, I think it's probably going to be in the context of some level of insulin resistance or overweightness, really insulin resistance, overweight would just be a, a way to get there, one of several ways to get there. Um, with carbohydrates generally pumping the sort of VLDL uh, production and triglyceride content. Um, whereas I think in a very healthy, lean body composition, very healthy metabolic control. Generally, blood lipids are going to go down on a higher fat, lower carb diet. And I don't think either of those are going to be all that affected by the combination. But probably if there is an effect of combining them, it's probably in the first case where fat and carbohydrate together are more likely to pump the triglycerides and VLDL particles out in the postprandial state than uh, if you had fat alone or carbohydrate alone. Um, so I, I guess if I were to summarize that, uh, I don't think the combination is all that 
going to be all that relevant to blood lipids, but the healthier you are metabolically and body composition wise, the less likely I would consider it relevant. Um, and it's probably more relevant to eat a lower carb diet if you are quite insulin resistant uh, for the benefits and and to do a higher uh, like whole food starch diet if you are very metabolically healthy and very lean for blood lipids. That makes sense. So if your if your trigs are low and you have no indications of insulin resistance, lean body composition, good muscle, then probably higher carb, lower fat would be the way to go to try to reduce lipid levels. I think is the what you're yeah. suggesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the the reason is that I, I mentioned before that in people with insulin resistance, they're generally hypersensitive to the lipid. Uh, synthesis pathway. This was in someone had a question about EPA. Um, the insulin resistant people are generally hypersensitive to the lipid synthesis pathway of insulin and resistant to the glucose handling pathway of insulin. And generally, uh, the glucose handling pathway of insulin also upregulates the LDL receptor, whereas the lipid synthesis related pathway of insulin downregulates the LDL receptor. Um, not directly on LDL receptor, but actually on PCSK9, which is the target of those super expensive uh, drugs like Repatha. Um, and so you generally, you uh, generally, if you are insulin resistant, uh, pushing the lipid synthesis pathway also hurts your LDL receptor activity. Whereas if you are very insulin sensitive and you have very good glucose handling, more pushing of that insulin pathway actually helps your LDL receptor activity. Um, so yeah, that's that. That makes, that makes sense for one that's in that latter category where the, the higher carb, lower fat would be the direction. What, like how far would you push that? So say, you know, I, I've, I've listened to some of your other discussions on the topic and the 20% fat level, 50% carb, you know, 30% protein would be kind of where I'm at. How far would you push the fat down and the carbs up just to try to get an effect? I haven't seen much effect going from 30% fat to 20% uh, fat with 40 carbs to 50 carbs. For, when you say 40 carbs, you mean 40%? 40%, yeah, sorry. Uh, for, so started at 40% yeah, carbs, well, 30% I mean, fat. Th yeah, I mean, you're on kind of a moderately low fat to quite low fat. Um, and it's, I mean, that might not be the main thing for you. So, um, I mean, I, I wouldn't really list that as the main thing anyway. So I like the, I think the biggest factors that are going to affect blood lipids in, in most people are, you know, excluding weight loss and things that impact inflammation are going to be saturated fat, cholesterol, and fiber. And, probably the biggest one that's most common is saturated fat as a trigger, but not everyone's sensitive to all those different things. So if you don't know what you're most sensitive to, what your blood lipids are most responsive to, and they might not be that responsive to your diet period. But if you're trying to figure out your dietary sense or your blood lipid sensitivity to diet, then I would take those different uh, potential triggers and do one at a time, test it for four weeks and retest the blood lipid panel and I would, to avoid a false positive, I mean, a false negative, I would make those as extreme as possible, you know? So mm -hmm. I, if you're testing low saturated fat, I would make at least the 75% cut in your saturated fat intake because, you know, otherwise how many four week periods are you going to keep testing your blood lipids to try to figure out if this one dietary component has an effect? So you know, I would go, if you wanted to test fat to carb ratio, I would go on like as extreme of a fat-free diet as you can just to avoid getting a false negative, you know, because right now you went from 30% fat to 20% fat. I, I don't know if 10, going to 10% fat or 15% fat is going to do the trick. I'm less inclined to think that based on you not getting results from 30 to 20. Um, but 
you know, if you went 30 to 10, I'd be even more confident that you really couldn't get any benefit out of doing that. Um, so the more extreme, the better, just for the sake of collecting a data point. That makes sense. That's probably the next step for me. I've tried the saturated and that definitely reducing that or rather increasing it makes it go up. So probably more extreme, low fat. And I think fiber was the third thing you mentioned, which I guess would translate to increasing fiber intake to a, to a much higher level to see the effect. All right, cool. Yeah. I would, I would just go through those, uh, those, I guess, four things, make them pretty extreme, test them for four weeks. And then once you sort of know the maximal effect of each of those factors, then you can start exercising the trade-off of, well, I know this works. So how far do I want to push this for my maintenance diet? Very helpful. Thank you, Chris. You're welcome. All right. Take care, Denny. Thank sure. you for your question. This episode was part of a Q&A for members of the CMJ Masterpass, where I hold monthly private Zoom Q&As for my members. The Masterpass also serves as a buyer's club with exclusive and massive discounts on your favorite premium foods and health products, including pasture-raised and wild meat and seafood, supplements, sleep accessories, water filters, phototherapy devices, and much more. If you'd like to participate in these Q&As, you can join the Masterpass at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash masterpass and use the code Q&A, spelled Q-A-N-D-A, Q&A, for 10% lifetime discount. I am currently working full-time on finishing my first book, Vitamins and Minerals 101, How to Get the Nutrients You Need on Any Diet. I will let you know when I have a release date. In the meantime, you can pre-order the book at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash book. Testing Nutritional Status, The Ultimate Cheat Sheet, has been newly released as version 1.3. This is my comprehensive system for managing nutritional status with lab tests, dietary analysis, and comprehensive intake of your signs and symptoms. The new version has a comprehensive guide to interpreting the Genova methylation panel. You can pick up your copy at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash cheat sheet. In my consulting, I am neither a medical practitioner nor a coach. I serve as your data analyst and your strategist. I teach you scientific principles of health and wellness, help you analyze your data, and help brainstorm actionable strategies. You can sign up for a consultation at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash consultations. Please consider supporting my work at no extra cost to you by visiting my support page and making a purchase with one of my affiliate links. Some of my most popular affiliates are also listed in the description of this video with links that will give me credit for your purchase. I will try to respond to comments when I can, but my presence will be intermittent while I'm finishing my book. I hope you enjoyed this and I will see you in the next episode.